one of the videos I watched of yours that I really loved was the burglar analogy. And I've watched some of your old ones, so I don't know how long ago you did this one, but mm -hmm. in talking about, you know, when a thought comes in and there's nowhere for the burglar to go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher your analogy and you'll, you'll fix it. <laughs> like the way I remember it is there's nowhere for the burglar to go if there's an empty room. So similarly, there's nowhere for the thoughts of the mind to go if you're not enmeshing and kind of engaging with them and, and as Eckhart Tolle would say, like feeding the pain body. But I'd love to hear just how you, how you um, feel about all that and think about all that. Yeah, well, you know, this is like the foundation of Advaita Vedanta, this understanding of the, the original thought of the mind is the thought I. And we could sort of use another analogy of that thought being like the the needle on the end of the thread, if you're if you're sewing or whatever, you weave the needle. The I thought is the needle that weaves through every other thought the mind thinks, because before I can say like I am hungry or I am tired or whatever the thought is, the I has to identify with the thought. And so, because that I thought happens so quick, of the I claiming everything. We don't even notice it because we're habituated to it. We're used to it. And so it's like weaving this long thread, almost like a necklace of different beads on this one um, string of the I thought. So, you know, a, a self-realization experience like the one I had at, at 27 is sort of when that, that string gets snapped or something and all the beads fly off and then you're just left with the empty eye with no association. And you just, the I, when it's not identifying with a particular thing, is everything it's omnipresent everywhere so you experience the the grass as i the cloud is i the tree is i the person is i everything's i because it's no longer being localized onto this or that so the question is always like how do we get the mind to do that or to stop doing that right. how do we get them to just remain open and let the i be open so that we can experience ourselves as we really are which is pure consciousness and that's where those complex concepts come in to kind of help us figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. So then um, what do you teach in terms of like the how, how to kind of mix that up? Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to the how, it's like we, we, we can give so many different instructions on how, but ultimately we have to know that there isn't just one way to do this or that it happens. Uh, there's many different ways or spiritual practices we can use that will all work synergistically to help this unraveling effect happen to where we can actually gradually day by day start to get a real experience of who we are as that universal I with no identity, no form, no name. So one of the things I teach in like 4D University is the three beliefs of ego. And in my in my classes there, I talk about like, let's, let's get a succinct definition for what ego is first. Mm -hmm. And once we really understand what it is, then we can start to understand how it is to be transcended, let's say. Yeah. In each of the three beliefs I give, there's a different definition of ego that correlates with that mm -hmm. belief. Because yeah. there really isn't just one perfect description of ego. We kind of have to come at it in different ways. Right. So the first definition i really like for the ego is that ego is the mental activity of identifying so it's not a person or an entity or a being of some sort but it's actually a function that's happening it's like a verb right it's not a noun right so there's this activity of identifying all the time i this i that i this i that and that's what we can call ego yeah so then um I feel like there's the oh the three beliefs. What are the other um, the other beliefs that you usually share? The other two. Yeah. So this is like I try not to make this too complex because I have all yeah. these different like they're all categorized. Right. So the three beliefs of the ego uh, are a little different than the definitions. Oh, okay. This, okay. this is what the ego believes over here, mm -hmm. and then over here, let's say this is what it is. So we have okay. what it is, and then what it believes, mm -hmm. or the system it operates on. Right. So I'll give you the three definitions and then we'll go to the three beliefs. So okay. the first definition is the mental activity of identifying, which we just cool. said. Yep. The second definition is um, 
the mind's war or the mind's conflict against reality. Mm -hmm. There's a part of our mind that's in conflict with reality that says yes or no to what's arising. Yep. And uh, the third definition is the ego is the belief in personal doership. I am the doer. I'm the controller. I'm making the gears of life turn. Yep. So those are the three definitions and they coincide okay. with the three beliefs. So the, the first belief of ego, you know, A Course in Miracles defines the ego as the belief in separation, which is a perfect definition for it. And so I like to say that once there's a belief in separateness, it will play itself out in the mind in these three ways. So the first thing the mind will do once it believes it's separate from the source is it will have the belief, I am lacking or I am incomplete. There's something I need to complete about myself, in myself, whatever it is. There's an yep. inadequacy felt, right? And so because it feels it's, it's missing something, that's, that's the belief that spurs this constant identifying. It's like the ego is trying to find itself. I'm this, that, I'm this, I'm that, because I'm lacking on the inside. Right. So that's where you can see the, the, the connection between the first belief, I am lacking, and the definition, the, the constant identifying with everything. So that's the first belief. The second belief is like the logical conclusion of the first belief, which basically says something along the lines of my happiness depends on outcomes or my fulfillment depends upon acquiring positive, pleasurable outcomes. So it's that drive to um, gain and conquer and dominate things to feel fulfilled in that lack. And that's where we get to the second definition of the mind's conflict with reality. Because what happens the second ego doesn't get what it wants? It starts fighting against reality, right? You're my yeah. enemy. You didn't give me what I wanted or needed. So you're the bad guy. I'm the good guy. Yeah. And there's this enmity against life, which is insane, of course. Yeah. And then the third belief is also the logical conclusion of the second one, which says, if, I, if my happiness depends on outcomes then that implies I'm in control, mm -hmm. right? I'm in control of life. Yeah. I'm in control of completing myself. I will do it. I will complete myself. I mean, literally nobody would go to the bar on the weekends. Nobody would try to, you know, make money in the world if they didn't feel this lack and they right. didn't feel that they were in control of fulfilling that lack. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's yeah. just like the very crux of what ego is. And yeah. that's of course the third definition the belief in personal doership, which means yes. I'm like a wave in the ocean, but I'm not being waved by the ocean. I'm independent of the ocean. All the other waves, they're getting moved by the ocean, but not this wave. I'm in control of how I wave, <laughs> when I wave, how large my wave is, when it rises, when it falls. I'm doing all of it. The ocean has no part yeah. to play in this equation. That's what right. the ego believes, as crazy as it sounds. Yeah. That you, the person, are some kind of independent actor. And therefore, you should feel prideful about the good things that happen to you. And then you should feel guilty about the bad things that happen to you because you did it, right? Right. That's the third. Oh, my God. It's so juicy. So, so much great stuff. So I remember one of your videos, there was a woman who is in your 40 university. Who's, I believe it's one. Yeah. She's a pilot. And I was like, oh, this is going to be so good. Because do you remember yeah. this one? Okay. Oh, because yeah. I'm yeah. like, wait, Aaron, of course, the pilot is in control or we'd all be dead. There, I'm like, how's he going to handle this one? <laughs> right. I'm like, there's yep, no way yep. that the pilot isn't in control of an airplane. Like, so I was like watching my, you know, the mind and the ego being like, oh, see, we got Aaron. We got him. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. like, there's no way he's going to be able to talk his way through this one. <laughs> there's no I, Aaron. The joke's on you, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> exactly. Well, it was really my ego just trying to pretend like, you know, that you weren't telling me what's the reality. But, um, but anyway, what I loved about it was that as you walked her through it, it's like, well, are you controlling the wind patterns? Are you controlling, I can't remember exactly where I was like, are you controlling right. the weather? Yeah. Are you controlling whether the birds are going to fly into your, you know, propellers or whatever? Are you controlling? No. Right. So I, can you just speak to that kind of like how we believe that we're in control and how we kind of you know the ego deceives us to think well in certain ways in certain ways we are like the airplane and there's certain ways we're in control here come on 
come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, who's, who's the one that's really in control is what we're really asking. Uh, the, the pilot analogy is such a perfect one for understanding non-doership because it, it seems like, yes, there is a person who's piloting the plane and they are independently in control. Yeah. But it's like, how often during the day do we try to remember something and we just can't remember it? And we're like, darn it, what was I just going to do? Or like, what was that thing I was looking for? And it's, you want to know what it is, but you can't because your brain can't find it or something. Right. So it's like even the most basic elements of what we think makes us in control, like remembering something, we're not actually in control of. Because like my mind could just forget something. And it's like, who in the moment of forgetting and just be like, I will myself to remember. And then boom, like you can't, right? You have to wait until right. it comes to right. you. And really, usually the, the more anxious you get trying, the harder it is to remember it. So it's like the pilot, the person who's piloting the plane has gone to piloting school. They've been taught and conditioned hundreds and hundreds of hours of flight practice and instructor training. So that when they get up to fly, their conditioning, their their own autopilot, right, yep. is flying the plane based on what it's yep. learned. Because right. if you somehow subtracted all of their memories of learning how to fly the plane in this in instructions, they couldn't fly the plane. Yeah. So it's like, what is that power? What is that intelligence that's allowing the pilot to remember constantly everything they've learned and perform it perfectly? Right. There's no way that that pilot is sitting there in the captain's chair and referencing every neuron in their brain of what decision to make from each memory they have. There's no way you could do that. There you are just piloting the plane and the hands just know what to do and the, the fingers just press the right buttons and I just grab the walkie talkie and I talk to the passengers like I was taught. It all just happens. Right. And then the ego says, I am doing it. It's like, well, no, you're not because without all of this assistance, you couldn't have done any of it. So right. we have to acknowledge that there is a greater power doing everything. There is, an, there is an intelligence that is like the same intelligence that beats my heart. I don't know how to beat my heart. Right, I right, couldn't right. do it in a million years. I don't know how to move my fingers and my hands. Like there is an intelligence in my body that's doing it on my behalf, so to speak. And that's yeah. also happening all the time. So it's like, can we just recognize that? Yes, we always have the intention to do the best we can do. No doubt about that. If you want to say there's such a thing as free will, we could probably say that's about where it ends. You know, my yeah. intention to do my best and then let's see how reality unfolds. Right. What I can't do is watch how reality unfolds and then tell reality that it's wrong and that you messed up reality. If only I had been in control, I would have done it right. Like right. that's the pride and the arrogance of ego, which is really just something that causes us unending stress and guilt because now every single thing in my life that doesn't go perfectly according to my ego's plan has to become a burden and a uh, guilt and stress and all of that. So it's much easier to just say, look, life is in control, God, creator, universe, whatever you call it. Yeah. Something greater than I, the person is in control and it's moving me. It's living through me. It's I am being lived right. Not doing the living. And then I just trust whatever happens. Yes. Yes. Much easier. Well, and I love the other part that I loved about that video. And like, literally I've told like everybody, I just tell everybody all the time. I'm like, well, oh, here's a good example when you think you're in control. And at one point you asked her or somehow came out that what happens in emergency situations when the conditioning was not going to work. Right. And she's like, oh, I actually had the most of like any pilot or something. It was like, he had like seven, like where everyone could have died. And I'm like, and, and she shared that, you know, she didn't even remember because at that point it's like, I have to surrender because I can't right. follow my conditioning. And to your point, the intelligence takes over and she's pushing buttons and all of a sudden, like they had a safe landing. And I was like, if you really believe you're in control of that story right there, I feel like any sneaky parts of the ego trying to tell you the pilot's in control. It's like, there's so many, there were so many layers to that. And to your point, it's like, reality is just happening and yeah how do we not resist what's just happening you know that's really the way i like to think about it yeah i remember a really amazing story from the las vegas massacre and mm -hmm. honey what was it 2019 or something like that Up there yeah do you remember the story of the guy i don't remember if he was like working the event or just i think he was just a guy at the concert but um 
in the moment, he just all of a sudden felt this energy move through him to go run over and start grabbing these people and pulling them to safety. And he saved like 20 or 30 people who were in the line of fire. And he didn't get shot once. Even though he was running to and from where this guy was shooting. And he was trying to pull these people and show them how to escape. And when the reporter interviewed him, she asked like, you know, what, what came over you and to be such a, a hero in this moment? And he was clueless how to answer. He yeah. was like, I don't know, like something just came over me and I don't even remember deciding to do it. I just found myself sprinting over to these people and telling them what to do. And it was like something was moving through me doing it and he didn't get shot. It's like, that's the power of life. It's if the more we get out of its way, the more powerfully it flows through us right. and we can learn to live always in that state, which we call the flow state, right? right. Where there's no longer a person who thinks they're in charge of the way reality is unfolding but you're very aware of, I'm just here to watch how reality unfolds. And like a surfer surfs a wave, I'm just yeah. trying to surf the wave. And yeah. that's when power of life can really use you. Yeah. So for you, how do you live your daily life in terms of the flow state? Like, what does it look like? I mean, without getting too personal, but just, you know, like, I'm just so yeah. curious, like, how do you go through your day? And how do you, how do you work through um, whatever comes up or, I'm just curious. Well, you know, that is a, a tough question to answer because it can be so different from day to day. But of course. The, the essence of it is we really we don't really have to try to surf the wave because our real self, the self we really are, is always in the wave. It is the wave, right? Yeah. So I just have to figure out what I'm doing to not surf the wave. I have to figure out what habits, mm -hmm. what patterns are coming up that are stopping me from naturally surfing that wave. Right. And that's just what we call self-awareness or mindfulness. Yeah. And we could simplify that down even more. And this is something else I teach is just contraction or expansion. Mm -hmm. If you can just pay attention to your state of being yeah. and all you, all I need to know in any moment is do I feel contracted or do I feel expansive? Mm -hmm. And the more you familiarize yourself with the difference, the easier you can tell when the mind is doing something to block your ability to be in the flow state, just because ah, I feel constricted. My being feels contracted right now, which yes. means there's a little bit of stress in the background yep. or whatever it might be. But that little bit of stress, that's the doer, right? That's part of my mind who's trying to take control of this situation yep. Yep. or you know, encourage me to try to do that. And I just have to shine the light of awareness on that part of my mind. Yep. And if we're not paying attention to how we're feeling during the day, we'll never really know when that's happening because yep. it's our emotional guidance system that's tuning us in to the, the thoughts the mind is having. Hey, everyone. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope that you were truly blessed by it. And I wanted to let you know that I'm really excited to now be partnering with an amazing conscious supplement company called Organifi. A lot of you know that I'm also passionate about holistic health and nutrition, and Organifi has been a staple in my daily health routine for a very long time. They make the most delicious, organic, and high quality superfood products that I've ever come across. And as you know, a healthy body is a great benefit for spiritual growth because the health of your body directly translates to the health of your mind. Everything is connected. So feeding your body with high vibrational superfoods straight from the earth is one of the best ways to create that environment for a healthy mind. But getting all the superfoods that your body needs in one day can admittedly be a little bit tough. And that is where Organifi can add a ton of value to your life. I personally start every day off with green, which is Organifi's really delicious blend of 11 superfoods like ashwagandha, chlorella, and moringa. And then in the middle of the day, I'll usually have a scoop of red, which is a delicious energy blend full of 13 adaptogens and antioxidants from berries to recharge your mind and body with a delicious blend of organic superfoods. Your body is an amazing organic machine, but it needs the right fuel and signals to function at its best. And red is full of adaptogens sourced from organic herbs and medicinal mushrooms. And these are compounds that balance hormones, prime your energy pathways, and alleviate stress. So instead of crushing your adrenal system with huge doses of caffeine every day, 
Adaptogens work with your body and give you natural, sustained energy all throughout the day. What's most important to me though about Organifi is the way that they go above and beyond to ensure the cleanest and purest ingredients in all of their products. They are USDA certified organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, certified glyphosate-free, and absolutely zero fillers. So I never go anywhere without Organifi and I never miss a day without taking it. And Organifi is offering a super generous discount of 20% off of your entire order when you use the coupon code ABKEY at checkout. So if you wanna upgrade your health regimen with Organifi, you can click on the link in the description box below to learn more about all the amazing products that they offer. And I promise you that your mind and your body are gonna thank you for it.